uh, well, hello, hello everyone. Uh, uh, today we're here at uh, Southwark uh, Youth Offending Service with Ilona Braithwaite, uh, who's here. Um, I mean, you have a very long uh, role title. Can you tell us what you are? Yes, it is a long role title, actually. It's a victim liaison restorative justice officer. Okay, well, that's interesting. Um, now, I'm going to go straight to the first question. Um, what's your background? Oh, my background um, is actually in banking. It's nothing to do with this it's at all. It's in banking. It's in banking. <laughs> it's nothing to do with this at all. Um, I, I think I, when I became interested in restorative justice was when I was a volunteer for a different organisation and I was volunteering in a prison. And, um, not an easy environment. Not an easy environment at all. And then I realised that um, the list of restorative approaches and options that I had without the victim being present was very, very small. So doing it within the prison, between the inmates, that was one thing. But when they'd harmed someone who wasn't there, I couldn't facilitate that. So then when I joined um, Southwark Youth Offending Service, I um, had the best opportunity because I could get access to both the victim and the offender. Mm -hmm. But what was the, 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 that jump between working uh, in the banking sector and and uh, and, uh, and then working uh, here in this sort of setting, which is radically different? I mean, yes. myself, I won't, I come from accounting mm. and then went to something else, but that that took time mm. as well. How was it for you? No, with me, it took time as well. I think prior to actually coming into this particular role, I'd been doing it bits and pieces and doing community mediation. With another with a different organization and it was a very very slow um entrance for me i it wasn't a jump at all i'd been doing it for years I, in fact i'd been um doing it one form or another for about 10 years well, that's interesting yeah. how was your experience as a volunteer it was pretty good it was pretty good i um volunteered with two different organizations who were both very very different the community member the, the, the community um organization they deal a lot with housing and um, that was completely different then to, to, to the prison. So I was gaining access and, and information and kind of like experience from two opposite sides. Mm -hmm. So no, and I was treated very well as a volunteer and I still volunteer for community mediation. It's incredible to say that, uh, you know, some time has passed from your experience, but uh, uh, using restricted justice in the context of housing mm. is still seen as something uh, innovative in a way. Mm. Um, I know that it's becoming quite extended now, mm. Mm. but it has been cooking for a long time. Mm. Uh, perhaps it, it, it should have been applied uh, uh, more widely, more quickly. But that's an interesting thing. So turning now to your role here in the Youth Offending Service in Suffolk, mm. um, can you tell me a bit about what, what your day-to-day -day is? Uh, what are your highlights? What's difficult? <laughs> what's less difficult? What's nice? Mm. Um, I think one of the, the, the beauty, if I can say, about um, being a restorative um, worker here in youth offending service is that we're the only organisation in the borough that get access to the victim and the offender. Mm -hmm. So to facilitate those meetings is we don't have to go to an outside agency to, to actually do, to do that. The, the, the harmer, we like to call them, mm -hmm. is um, comes to us and whether it's um, pre-court or after sentence, we actually um, get an opportunity to, to speak to them, to, to let them know how the victim feels and basically just to make them aware of what they've done. Nine times out of ten, the offender, the person, the harmer, um, is reluctant really to actually face up to that fact. Mm -hmm. But with work and preparation, that happens. So for me, I will contact the victim first. So I will get a case allocated to me by my manager and um, that's how it starts. Do you, do you think that uh, uh, harmers need to be persuaded? Is, is it a hard sell for them? And if it's so, uh, do you think that uh, the feeling of remorse that they could feel is genuine? I mean, I'm sure that if they do participate in a restorative justice conference, at the end of it, uh, because of the powerful emotions mm. involved in that single event, mm. uh, they will feel something. Mm. But 
but I imagine that a lot of them, you know, might think, what is it uh, for me that mm. uh, what, what am I going to get out of this? Mm. And they don't see it clear at all. No, they don't. They don't. They don't. Um, if they're reluctant because um, they're embarrassed or feeling a bit ashamed, we can overcome those in the preparation for the actual um, meeting. Um, if they don't want to do it because they don't feel sorry, or they just, uh, or if I think it's going to cause more harm to the victim, then I won't let it go ahead, mm -hmm. and I'll tell the victim that that young person's not ready at the moment. Mm -hmm. What sort of cases uh, do you consider um, eligible and suitable for restorative justice here? I mean, uh, I'm sure that uh, petty crimes such as burglary or loitering, mm -hmm. and things that uh, uh, carry knives, mm -hmm. uh, which I think now carry a, a mandatory uh, form on the. Yes, they do. Um, custodial mm -hmm. sentence, mm -hmm. those things uh, are probably candidates, but do, do you do you ever have to deal with uh, uh, more serious cases such as violence, uh, sexual uh, harmful behaviour, things like that? Yes, we do. We do. So, um, any kind of offence that comes through um, our doors, as long as there's a victim there, then we will contact the victim to find out whether or not they are interested in having their restorative option it doesn't need to be um, a face-to-face -face meeting. It mm -hmm. can be a letter of apology. It can be shut, shut up a mediation between the mm -hmm. two parties. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be a face-to-face. -face. And once it's been risk, risk assessed, if everything's okay and we've you know, thoroughly gone through it, then we normally try to proceed to a face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. And how... How do those referrals come to you? Because uh, you have mentioned before that uh, you have a, a quite good uh, working relationship with um, uh, the police force here. Mm. What's, what's the process? How, how did that come about? Um, the relationship that we have with our police is very good. And that has more than, well, it's been established throughout the years, really. So um, they know that we can't do our job without them. We mm -hmm. cannot get access to the victim's details unless they give them to us. So the victim code says that they are entitled to have a service. So, mm -hmm. you know, there isn't really that, that area where um, I know that some of my colleagues in other services struggle because they don't actually get that information. We don't have that problem here. Mm -hmm. And it's because we're both working, although in a parallel way, we're working towards we're for the same goal. Mm -hmm. do, do you think that... Uh, uh, the police uh, members involved uh, in, in in part of your work mm -hmm. are, are genuinely persuaded by the idea of restorative justice. Do you think that they feel it works, it reduces reoffending, and it uh, means uh, a better outcome for uh, the victim and the harder? Definitely. Our officers here are definitely, they've all been trained restoratively by the police and they actually do join in when we are offering training for members of staff here. Okay, that's interesting. So the police have been trained as well. Mm. It's not like they have been told, you need to do this from now mm. on. Mm. They know where it goes, where it is. Mm. And uh, you mentioned as well that some of them uh, uh, facilitate uh, uh, restorative conferences as well. Mm. How does that work? Um, they don't do it here, not in, in this yacht. In, in this yacht, we're well staffed. So we do all of that. What they do, they give us um, the victim's details in, to enable that to happen. Mm -hmm. They may say from time to time, um, oh, Lilma, I'd like you to contact this particular person so that we can see what the outcome should, should, should be for the person who's harmed them. Um, but on the whole, they don't really get involved with the actual restorative, but they understand it and they know what the benefit is. And they're very victim-focused as well. Mm -hmm. And how do you feel that uh, uh, things are going here at Suffolk? Because mm. uh, uh, I think that... Uh, you have been doing this for quite a long time. I mean, not you yourself, mm. particularly perhaps as well. Mm. But uh, this service is good, it's, it's got good experience to mm. show as well. Mm. Do you mm. think that uh, generally uh, the parties involved in conferencing uh, the harmer and the victim, do you think that they walk away with uh, positive feelings, feeling that they have uh, gained something from the experience? Mm. Most definitely. Even when I think that... Um, the person who has been harmed is unlikely to get an apology. And I don't discount it because I think that that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. I tell them in the preparation that he may not actually say sorry to you, but this is your opportunity for you to say how that incident has made you feel. It's not about him apologising. Nine times out of ten, they do apologise. And they will say, you know, oh, I didn't realise. 
because they're not thinking about anybody else. They're just thinking about themselves at that split moment. They're not realizing that this is another individual that you've hurt. They're not even thinking that this is, they've almost dehumanized that individual. So they don't think about them. Well, if they did, they probably wouldn't. Absolutely. They wouldn't do it. They wouldn't commit the offense. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. Okay. It's interesting that you say that, uh, you know, uh, a restrictive uh, intervention doesn't need to be specifically a conference, doesn't need to culminate with that. Um, It is in the mind of a lot of people that that's what this is about. Mm. But there's a lot of prior work uh, where you need to meet with both parties, Mm. assess, talk to them about uh, expectations. Managing expectations Mm. cannot be easy. No, and sometimes it's not. Okay. And and then you have a lot of uh, these different possible outcomes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and outputs, mm. and, and you have mentioned the range. One of them, obviously, is the conference where you sign a contract and you, mm. uh, the Harmer offers an apology, mm. and then something else happens because mm. there is work that uh, happens after that point mm. as well. Mm. So what other options do you consider uh, equally valuable uh, or valid here? Sometimes a letter of explanation is all that victim wants. They want to. The first question is, why me? Why, 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 what was I doing to make that happen to me? You know, what was you know. That is such a, a big thing. And sometimes a letter of explanation is, will do. Not even an apology, just an, ex- an explanation of what they were doing and why they did what they did. I suppose that some people might want to know that they, they weren't specific targets, they mm. were random Absolutely, targets. absolutely. Uh, because otherwise you, you would have that feeling of insecurity every time you walked out of your exactly. front door. And that happens so many times. So many times that they'll say, um, I must have been doing something. Can you ask him or her what I was doing that upset them? And they, they take on a lot of the blame for themselves. They take on, they almost reduce what, what the offender's done, first the harbour, to making it about them. Because they just so, so, it's in that cycle where they... That's, they that's very interesting. So, so they, they, they put themselves in the role of a perfect victim. Mm. They think that I was, I was primed for, for being Absolutely. robbed or, yeah. or being attacked, mm. something like that. Mm. It's a bit like, I mean, the parallel is not, like, it's not perhaps uh, the most accurate, but it's like uh, when uh, a woman has been uh, um, sexually attacked mm-hmm. and she, she starts to think, you know, I mean, how do I know this? Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, uh, was I dressing too provocatively? Was I doing something wrong? Was I uh, in the wrong place yep. and doing the wrong things? Yeah, very common. That's, that's uh, surprising because, mm-hmm. uh, uh, I mean, th- there's a... Uh, a lot of people that study victimology, mm. uh, I don't have that background. I didn't know that, but mm. it's interesting to hear from you because you have yeah. first-hand experience. Mm. Mm. Okay, that's very interesting. Mm. Um, now, going back to your work here, mm-hmm. um, what do you think are the key assets? What's the best thing that you do as a service in here? And what do you think are the key um, challenges that, that you face as well yeah. working in the youth offending service here? I think um, some of the benefits is that we offer, we contact, we aim to contact, to contact 100% of our victims, um, whether or not they actually want to take up the service or not. That's part of the role, and I think that we're very successful in doing that. So that has been properly implemented from the victims? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the challenges are... Probably the challenges that we face everywhere. Um, I think that time is a big challenge for us, for myself, shall we say. I think that um, cuts are happening all the time. So some of the organisations that um, <coughs> we used to use for further work, mm-hmm. to referrals, some of those don't exist anymore. So um, we're having to use, we're not having to use, but we use victim support more than what we probably we would have done before and a lot of that is because of the cuts so time the cuts some of the challenges are as well is that um what restorative justice really is mm-hmm. is actually not known really outside people don't really understand it and so when you call victims for example you have to explain to them what it is that you're talking about yeah i have to explain to them that i'm actually working for them and my work is, is victim-focused, victim-led. Sometimes they have um, a preconceived idea that I'm trying to make life easy for the offender. Hmm. And um, I do point it out that the code says that that's not to happen, and that is not what my role is. 
that young person has actually already got a case manager who is working relentlessly for that young person. So my role is not to do the same. We're in the youth offending team and I realise that um, it is an offender focused organisation. However, my role is to concentrate on the victims and with any thing that I can do to make sure that I get those two parties to, to, together to reduce um, offending behaviour and also for that person to think twice about hurting somebody else. Mm -hmm. It's it's quite interesting that because what you do is you provide a counterbalance. Mm. Like you said, you have the um, the case managers there uh, who are there to see what uh, options are open to mm. uh, the harmer or offender, and your role is quite the opposite. Mm. It's to, to to provide balance and make sure that victims are informed at all times mm. and they have this option open of uh, participating in restorative justice mm. to pursue their own uh, outcomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. Mm. Um, like you said, uh, a lot of the things that, I mean, uh, budget cuts and uh, lack of time, mm. that's something that everyone these days can complain about because mm. uh, it's happening everywhere. Yes, yeah. One one that you don't have uh, here is uh, 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 the problem of uh, getting referrals because you work so closely, you have such a good relationship with the police mm. and they actually uh, refer every case, every victim to you. Uh, to see if uh, uh, they would like to take up the option of restorative justice. Yeah. So oh. that, that is a benefit. That's a benefit. And that's very good. Mm. Well, I'll tell you what, it's very interesting. Um, I wish there were more people uh, uh, in the forum talking about uh, the work of uh, youth offending teams mm -hmm. because it's so crucial. I think that uh, uh, I have met with other people as well that work with young people in a different context. Mm. And uh, we were talking about how important it is to get people uh, at this age, when there's almost the preconception that they're potentially criminals, mm, I know. Uh, and also because uh, there's that expectation, uh, it's almost like they feel forced to act up and fulfill that mm. uh, role mm. uh, and get into trouble. Mm. Uh, and here you are uh, at the first step when they make some small mistake, hopefully. Mm. Yes, and sometimes it's it is just a mistake, an error of judgment. Um, we can't demonise them for that. The media already does that. You know, a group of people are okay. Hoodies. Hoodies, <laughs> You know, exactly. wearing, wearing a particular exactly. item of clothing. I know. So they're already thought of as in a very, very negative light. Um, you pick up a paper and you'll read something terrible that that's been, that's, well, that's happened. So we try not to do that here. We try to look at the individual. We try to look at everything to find out what is the underlying reason for that behaviour. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it can be obvious after mm -hmm. the case manager has done their assessment. And sometimes it takes a little bit, bit more delving into. Mm -hmm. I, think that, I think that you hit it on, uh, on the head there when you said the media portrays. Uh, and I tell you for why. Uh, the media portrays sometimes that uh, uh, when there's uh, an RJ initiative or intervention, mm -hmm. that's for the benefit of the offender. Yep. They don't realise that uh, by addressing the issues uh, that caused that offender to, 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 to behave in that way. Mm. But it is reducing reoffending, mm. reducing overall crime in an area, in a mm. community. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the social benefit. That's the benefit for the victim first. Mm -hmm. And then um, the knock on effect as well is felt uh, across the whole community because you Absolutely. have that one less person uh, reoffending and also potentially talking to uh, his or her mates about, you know, Perhaps you shouldn't do that because you know I went through this and this is what happened. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. I think that I think that we need to we need to work more on on our media. Uh, yes. Oh, image. yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Although to be to to, to be fair, and uh, knowing how uh, uh, newspapers work these mm. days, you know, it, it seems like a quite a struggle. Mm. So, Luma, I'm not going to take any more of your time because I know you're very busy. Thank you very much for receiving me no, here. Thank you. Thank uh, you. You have uh, a fantastic place here. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen uh, police people uh, uh, through that door as well. Yeah. So you're working together really well. That's that's a good no, example. Very I think well. that's, uh, mm -hmm. That should be uh, looked at in every other place. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.